So thank you for staying with us. We now have the last part of the lectures on our tools and how to access the data in practice. So Frédéric showed you a bit how it's done, well, a lot how it's done behind the scenes, and I'm going to show you what we do with it in front of the scene. And I'm going to start with showing you just how you can get our data, because we have a lot of data integrated and maybe you need it for your own analysis. And the first thing to be clear about is that our BG data is completely free to use. It is uh, released under CC0, Creative Commons 0. That is the license which uh, means you could, which is the same as a full public domain. So it's like the text of Shakespeare or something. You can completely do. So this is the same as, for example, all the resources at the NCBI. So if you take uh, a gene sequence at GeneBank, you don't need to ask them for permission to do something with it. You don't need to, to, to uh, cite them. You don't need to do anything. There's no legal obligation. It is totally with no legal obligations. Then there are academic standards, which we expect that if you use BG a lot, you would cite us, but we are not going to send lawyers after you, basically. So that's the first thing. And I have a small WooClub uh, poll to make sure that this is clear for everyone. So um, I will stop sharing to launch the poll. So yeah, I have launched the poll. Can you please vote on the availability of WooClub data, of WooClub, of BG data? WooClub yes, so it's data. a different link from the master document. You have yes. the link to the WooClub of this. Uh, but it's always the same. The WooClub link is always the same, actually. So if yeah, you yeah, just keep right. that tab open, yeah. it's always the same. That's what's nice with WooClub. And uh, since I just explained it, I hope it is clear. But uh, this way, we we reinforce the learning. Uh, Valeria, you can uh, tell the SIB training group that we that we learned from the train the trainers course. So I think this is pretty clear. I'm going to restart sharing immediately. Um, Okay, so do you see the WooClub on your screens? Am I sharing the WooClub? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So everyone agrees the data is freely available. So I think this is clear to everyone. That's cool. Now, when you download our data, we have download files that you can access uh, from BG and we can provide either process data or expression codes. What we call process data is really the quantitative data. So for RNA-seq would be counts, RPKMs, TPMs. And we provide process data for the data which we process and where this quantitative expression is relevant. So affymetrics, bulk RNA-seq and single cell RNA-seq. We do not provide it for in situ because it comes from the model organ database and we do not provide it for expression sequence tags, ESTs because uh, we have it for historical reasons, but it's not such good data. And you get for each species uh, a folder you can download, which is compressed and you can uncompress, which will contain all the information of processed expressed data. And so you can know that this data has been already curated. So it's wild type, healthy. You can know that if we tell you this is uh, liver, we check that it's liver. And you can know that it was processed by uniform pipeline, so that if you compare the different data sets and combine them in some analysis, they will all process the same way, mapped to the same genomes in a uh, consistent manner. And we also have files with expression calls. So what Frédéric was just explaining, where and when a gene is present or absent, and you can download this. For example, if you want to filter, you want to do some experiment where you want to limit, so you want to look at interactions between proteins in the brain, but you want to limit to genes which have expression in the brain and not have all the interactions which are found by an interaction uh, experiment, but for genes which would not be in a healthy individual expressed in the brain, you can download this and filter present in the brain. And you can uh, either use our call or decide to be more or less stringent since we also provide the p-values and FDR corrected p-values. And we have simple files which just like you first go on the gene page, you just see the anatomy. So that's what the simple files are. You're just going to see the anatomy without much details, summarized over all the data types or advanced where you're going to be able to see uh, 
all the parts of the condition, if you want to select on sex, development of the stage, and so on, and also the different types of data. If you only trust calls from RNA-seq, but not from microarrays, you can uh, filter on this. And these are classic CSV files that you can import into any tools such as R, Python, Pandas, Excel, if you have enough memory, depending on the file. And so what's in these files? In the processed file, you have the experiment ID, the library ID, so all the information you need to go back, the library type, and then for each gene, so we have a row per gene per library, you will have the gene where it is expressed. So here you have the, the cell ontology, the development of stage, the sex and the strain, all this information. Then you have all the information. So if you just want the raw read counts and you want to treat them, you can have them. We also normalize by the alternative normalization TPM, which we recommend and FPKM, which we provide for historical and consistency reasons. You have the rank, which corresponds to the rank score that uh, Freddy was speaking about, whether it's present with what p-value and how it is used in BG. If you want to be consistent between what you see in the libraries, and what you see on our web page. It could be found present in one library, but because when we combine it with the other information, uh, with the, the correction for multiple testing, the FTR, it is no longer considered present, so it could be not part of the code. And we provide something similar for microarray. And then for the present absent, you have a simple file with the gene, its name, where it is expressed, when it's expressed, so you have here, the, the anatomy, development, and so on. This is the simple file, so there's not a lot of details. Whether it's present, what uh, trust we have. Uh, Frederick spoke about gold, silver, bronze, and its uh, expression rank again. And you have uh, complex or simple files. So this is our data. Now, how do you obtain it? But first, you can go to the web page. If you go on our homepage, you see all those species. They're not just pretty pictures. You can click on any one of them. And when you click on one of them, it unfolds. Uh, so here I clicked on human. It unfolds this box where you have all the downloads. So you can download the process data here uh, with the RNA-seq, Affymetrix, or single cell just the experiment information to know what experiments we have, which is smaller, or all the full files of process data with the counts, TPMs, and so on. And you can also on the web page access if you, you, you can switch between accessing these process data or the present absent calls data. You can also get it directly to an R package. And if you're working in R, I really recommend this way because these files are quite big and annoying to, to pass yourself. Whereas in the package, we already have all the information to all the, the methods, sorry, to pass our data. So it's our functions which allow you to directly retrieve RNA-seq or microarray data from BG. And we provide you process gene expression data in, uh, with functions to format into an expression set object, which is classic um, bioconductor R packages uh, treating expression. And we have uh, we have, have a publication and we have a uh, documentation on Bioconductor and because part of Bioconductor we get regular alerts which make sure that we always make sure it's working on all the different environments so if you have some older version of R on Windows it should work and whatnot. Uh, so that's one way to recover and so now I will do another WooClap. So exit. And here I'm going to poll you. So this is not a quiz. I want to know from you, if you see these different ways of getting uh, data from BG, what would you like to do? How would you like to get data? And I presented you the web and R, but we also have FTP and Sparkle for those who are more into programmatic access. So if you can tell me what would be your favorite way to get the data. So we don't have a hardcore geeky bioinformatician uh, accessing through Sparkle so far. Because I have hidden slides to present the Sparkle endpoint. I, <laughs> I totally do it if people vote for this. 
So you can tell your hardcore bioinformatician friends that we do have a Spark at endpoint. Um, OK, so most people want to download from the web or go through the R package. OK, so thank you. This was just a little uh, poll to know how you feel about it. Now I'm going to present the gene page. I will be pretty short on this because both in my demo at the very beginning and in what Frédéric presented now, we heard a lot of the gene page. So just to make sure that we, when I present all our tools, I, we remind you of this. Expression conditions are defined in the gene page by anatomy, development, sex, or strain. You can restrict the data you use. If you remember earlier this morning, I showed you that we had the list. We could click yes or no for RNA-seq, microarrays, and so on. We show significant present and significant absent from direct observation and for propagation, as Frederick just explained. You can see the autologs and the paralogs, which we take from the OMA database, the autolog metrics database, which is a database of autologs and paralogs. And you can send them directly to our expression comparison tool or just get the list. And we have cross references at the bottom of the page to, for example, Uniprot Ensemble, which is our key reference for genes, which are in for species which are an ensemble and for model organ data is when it's relevant. For example, if you go on a zebrafish gene, there will be a link towards ZFIN, which is the model organ database of zebrafish. And I have a little WooClap of this too. So this is again asking your opinion. I would like to know when you go to the gene page, what would you like to see first? So you would like to see, you can click on only one or several. So if you only interested in development decision, not in anatomy, sex and strain, just click on this. But if you want to always see all four conditions together, click on all four, okay? Yeah, actually, we won't be able to distinguish because between people who want only sex or all of them at the same time. This is not a full usability study. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, it confirms that there is a, that the first uh, axis of expression that most of you want to see is anatomy. Okay, so thank you for your votes. So I see that there's the less love for strain uh, and development of stage and sex are obviously important, but really anatomy remains the main structure. When I ask where is a gene expressed, when I ask about the expression pattern of a gene in an animal, I usually mean it's expressed in the brain or wherever. So that's consistent with our expectation, thank you. Now I'm going to present a bit more complicated tool. So these I went fast because this was stuff you already heard about just putting it back in context of the tools of BG. This is a tool we haven't spoken about yet and it's quite important. So I'm going to take a bit more time on this. Top anat, top like the top and anat like anatomy. So what top anat does is does very similar to gene ontology enrichment, but instead of asking what gene ontology Function annotations are more frequent than I expect by chance in my list of genes. I'm going to ask in which anatomical structures are my genes more expressed than I expect by chance. So I have a list of genes and I'm going to ask, are these genes actually much more frequently expressed? I have, for example, digestive genes, are they much more expressed in liver and intestine than expected by chance? And for example, if I did some experiment where I was trying to find the list of genes, but I don't know if I did, this would give me a strong confirmation. So for each gene in BG, we have expression in an anatomical structure. That's what we do. And if I have a list of genes, some structure will be represented many times in the list. It means that many of the genes on my list have an association to the same anatomical structure. So for example, here I have a list of genes and in my list of uh, more than 3000 genes, I have 3,500 more or less genes. I have 46, which have expression in the frontal pole of the brain, which is Uberon 2795. So I have here 46 of my genes in my list, which are expressed in this uh, frontal pole. I also have, sorry, my list is only 100. Sorry for my mistake. I also have 56, which are not expressed in the frontal pole. So is this 46 out of, 50, out of 112? 
102, sorry, more than expected by chance. Well, I can compare what do I expect from the general genome. And if I look at all the genes in the human genome, this is human genes, I have about 10% which are expressed in the frontal pole. This total is much more than the 20,000 protein coding genes because it also includes non-coding genes which have significant expression, okay? And so we can do a ratio between these two and we find that I have six times more six times more expression of my gene list in the frontal pole than expected by chance if it was these proportions. And so we can do a Fisher exact test, which is like the more exact version of a chi-square test. And we find that, uh, sorry, this is what I expected, the six, I would expect six. So I have 7.6 times more than I expect. This is super duper mega significant. And even if I cry for multiple testing, but I tested over all the anatomy structures, it's still very significant. So we have a strong enrichment of the genes in this gene list in the frontal pole of the brain. And these are genes which are the number one example. If you go to the top and that website, we have pre-computed examples. These are genes which have been from various studies associated with autism and uh, similar uh, um, phenotypes. Autism and schizophrenia, actually, that's it. Okay, so we it makes sense biologically to find them more in the frontal pole of the brain, which is known to be involved in autism and schizophrenia. So in a more general way, what we do is that for each anatomical structure for which we have data, we're going to compare our gene list to a background, look if they are express how many are expressed there relative to expectation from the background, do a Fisher or hypergeometric test. And we're going to do a deconvolution of the ontology graph, which um, is a bit complicated, but basically uh, if you have a gene which is expressed in the frontal pole, it's necessarily also expressed in the brain as Frederick just showed. So if, it's, if these genes are more expressed in the frontal pole, they're also more expressed in the brain, but that's not extra information, the same information, which I'm saying again, you have the same thing in the gene ontology. If you have more hydrolases in your list, you probably have more enzymes because hydrolases are a type of enzyme, but that's boring. So we have modified the, the R package top go, which is a package for gene ontology enrichment, which does this deconvolution and we've modified it so that it treats not the gene ontology, but Uberon, the ontology of anatomy, and we can do the same deconvolutions. So if you use our uh, top anat uh, uh, tool, so it allows you, again, you can put any gene list and get the enrichment in anatomical structures across any species, which is in BG. Obviously the species have more data will be more powerful, but you can do it in any species which is in BG. And something I should mention here, I didn't write on the slide. It only works on data, which is observed in that species. So if you do a gene ontology enrichment test on platypus, what you're going to see is what we hope to be the function in platypus from blast hits on human and mouse, basically. No one has done the molecular studies of the gene function in platypus. If you do a top anat analysis on platypus, what you see is expression in platypus, strictly in platypus. So it's experimentally observed in platypus on data which was curated from platypus. None of you study platypus, but it's the same for any other species. So if you do such enrichment analysis, and this is true both for gene ontology and for anatomy, I just want to uh, attract your attention to these important pitfalls. Background is critical. Uh, here I compared my genes to the whole genome in the example, because any gene in the genome could have been found associated with autism or schizophrenia. But for many studies, you could not find all genes. If I look at genes for which I find positive selection in humans relative to chimpanzee, that's only genes for which I had autologs between human and chimpanzee, and for which I was able to do an alignment and calculate positive selection. And so my background should be those genes, not all the genome. And this is very important because otherwise you get very wrong results. Because we test over all the anatomical structures or the gene ontology, all the go terms, we have a lot of multiple testing and you have to pay attention to this in the interpretation of your results to the multiple testing correction. And as I mentioned, the terms are in a graph as you've seen. So they are not independent. If you're in the frontal pole, you're in the brain. So it is very important to pay attention to this. It doesn't mean you always have to 
decorrelate because sometimes the interpretation without decorrelation makes sense, but you have to be aware of it, pay attention to it. It's the biologist who should, must make the final interpretation knowing the pitfalls, or we can use uh, in top and at the algorithms from top go for decorrelation, ELIM, which is very stringent, or weight, which is less stringent. And Topanat is on our web page and is in the BGDBR package. So you can you have a gene list you want to look in a cool, easy way. You can just paste that gene list on our web page, like you have many web pages for gene ontology enrichment. But if you also want to include anatomical enrichment testing in an R uh, script or pipeline, if you have already in R, you already have your gene list there, then you can just call our package and very easily get your. Uh, anatomical uh, enrichment and also all the options which exist in the top go package for those who know it are in the top and at version in BGDB, whereas on the web page we had to restrict a bit the options for usability. So here I'm going to ask you on the Google Doc. So I'm going to the Google Doc. Oh, there. Can you tell us a gene list that from your experience you would like? to test in Topanat. When you have time, you'll go back to Topanat, think, oh, this is cool. I can test where my genes are expressed. And I have this list of genes from my work. What would be that list of genes? Genes involved in cat schizophrenia. So I see some gene name. I think if you write all the gene name, that's going to be a bit long. So more general list, like, you know, genes involved in this disease or this process or found by this test for selection or different reacting to this drug and so on. I don't know if you hear background noise on my side, but we have a, a campus day of visit of kids. So I have a lot of noise behind. So I'm sorry if you hear kids screaming. Hormone and biosynthesis genes, nice. Inflammation genes. Genes specific for tissue resident memory T cells. Where do you expect to find them expressed? Let me ask. Jose? Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you for your examples. If you have other examples, you can add them. So I think it's most, from my experience of playing with Topanet for several years, it's most interesting when you have a pathway which is not directly anatomical, for example, hormonal biosynthesis genes, and you're wondering where are they expressed. Genes expressed in liver endothelial cells will probably be expressed in liver endothelial cells, so it can allow you to check that our database works well, but you might not learn so much new biology, right? Inflammation genes is also interesting. So I'll go back to my slides. Thank you very much. You can continue writing if you want. So one thing that BG does and is quite unique, I think, is that we have homology of anatomy. I don't think it's unique. I know it's unique because the other people who said they would do this 10 years ago didn't because it's way too much work and we were the only ones crazy enough to do this. So what we do is that our biocurators, mostly our, only our lead biocurator, reads the literature on homology of anatomy. So you know all autology of genes, but there's also homology at the anatomical level, right? So uh, our arm is homologous to the uh, forelimb of a mouse and to the wing of a chicken, right? So that's anatomical homology. And a lot of anatomical homology is not trivial. So our curator reads paleontology literature, evolution of development literature, comparative anatomy, zoology literature, textbooks to get the most accurate information on this homology. And this is all recorded in our 
database. And so we give you access to it. And the first way we give you access to it is we have a tool which you will find in the, if you unfold the search menu here, there is a search for anatomical homology. And there, what you will find, you will get to this page where you will see the, you will be able here to put identifiers of Uberon or cell ontology. You select species and you can find which of these anatomical structures are homologous between these species and what is the homologous structure. So here I put all the anatomy structures from human, which have been studied in the GTEC project. And I asked, do they have homologues in the zebrafish Danioraria, which is the model organism, uh, the most amenable to experiment in fish. And so the question is, how many of these structures which are studied in GTEC <clears throat> can I compare to studies in zebrafish? And I have 31 here, which have, Where's my, I lost my mouse, that's cool. Yeah, I don't know where my mouse is. Oh. So I have 31, which are in the, no, I got my mouse back. Okay, 31 here, which have homology. And you see that sometimes the homology is quite simple. Both zebrafish and mouse have a hypothalamus and it's homologous. Sometimes it's not so obvious. So the left ventricle of the heart and the primary heart field are homologous or the lung, you see the last one here. And again, I lost my mouse, this is an annoying bug. Okay, here, here the last one, you notice that the lung of mouse, of human, sorry, is not homologous to the gills with which the fish breathes, but to the swim bladder with which the fish puts air inside and use it to change their level in the water. And this is a well-known fact in comparative anatomy, but maybe most molecular badges don't know it. So here we give this information. And again, my mouse disappears. This is the bug I already had in Zoom. Okay, so that's one thing we can do with the anatomical homology. And the other thing we can do, we already showed you a bit is the expression comparison. So if you click here on the uh, analysis, you can unfold here expression comparison on the home page. It's big button expression comparison. Here you can put the list of gene identifiers, either from your own study or directly from the autologs or paralogs of a gene page, and you're going to get in which structures these uh, genes are expressed, and you will see only the structures which have homology. So if the gene, uh, if the, these are only, these are all uh, um, brain, this is a brain gene, the, the first example here, it's a brain gene, known brain gene, which is found in all animals, all bacterian animals. And here you have, for example, uh, this is a uh, uh, Feliscatus, the cat, and this is a fly base or so fly and so on. And you find that overall everywhere is found in the central nervous system with very high score and found in all uh, species present, right? So this is a brain specific gene common to bacteria and indeed, and what we see here is that I have the central nervous system, which is a homologous description of all the central nervous systems of the different animals. And going back to the Google doc, so this was a rapid presentation of our tools. And I'm just going to ask you again for your opinion, what is your favorite BG tool? So with everything we presented this morning, what would be your favorite tool to use? Topanat, the gene page, the expression comparison, the homology of anatomy, the downloading files. Also, you can mention the R package, BGDB R package, which allows you to get the data into R or to analyze Topanat and R. So I'm letting you uh, write your favorite BG tool in this Google Doc. Again, if you're shy, you don't have to put your name. The tool is more important. So, uh, Vinyaka, Vinayaka, you're in the table above or in the table below. Otherwise we can copy paste it.
Is the Google Docs shared? Are you seeing it? Frédéric, can you confirm? Yeah, 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 yeah I see. Okay. I don't know. Usually there's this kind of green thing around it. I don't see it. So. So a lot of love for Topanat, either because it's super cool, which it is, or because the last thing I spoke about. Well, you spoke about expression comparison uh, last. You're right, you're right. But uh, I think the Topanat is very cool. <laughs> also, if I may say something really cool about Topanat is that every time we test it on some gene list, because I like to play with it. So I see some paper with a gene list or some study on Twitter or something, and I try it in top and nut, and the results always make sense. And this is super reassuring because top and nut is built on everything else we've presented you this morning. So if we made mistakes in curating the data sets and then, and then uh, annotating them, top and nut wouldn't work. If we made mistakes in the quality control of the data, it wouldn't work. If we made mistakes in calling genes present absent, it wouldn't work. It only works because everything else is correct. So it's also an excellent quality control for us to check, right, that it works. Could I ask to CR Vinayak, uh, what would be your use case for analytic genomology tool? If you accept to tell us, because it's a, maybe yeah, the less cited tool among our tool, and I'm curious to know about what you would plan to do with that. Because it's directly useful to our expression comparison, but but alone it's it's interesting to know. Yeah. Okay. Just to with your relationships. Yeah. And so I should emphasize again: the anatomical homology you see is not is never derived from our expression data. So this is a question I get quite often. We do not use our expression data to derive homology. Because then it would be circular if we use our expression data to derive homology and say, is it conserved in the homolog homologs? Well, yeah, because that's how we calculated it. Our homology only comes from the literature. And in the literature, expression might be used as a evidence, but then it's used as a source of evidence someone external to BG, who's an expert who has been considering this. And usually it's specific marker genes, for example. And then we, if you are really interested in our anatomical homology, we have a detailed file on our GitHub where you can have all the details of how we inferred it with every line of evidence and every bibliographical reference. So maybe the same homology has been reported by three different studies, one based on fossils, one based on a marker gene, and one based on developmental patterns, and we will uh, give this separately. So thank you for your contributions.